Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so thanks to Fabian and the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this lecture. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here at the Erwin Schrödinger Institute. I was here a few years ago in a um, uh, quantum information type workshop. And um, so my, the aim of this lecture is to give you the like, first few slides a very broad overview of what I think um, are interesting directions at the moment and then the bulk of the talk after that are going to be things which I think are relevant, which I've done of late. Um, and I certainly look forward to the two weeks I'm going to be spending here in particular to find out what a quantum path is. But anyway, this is what I'm intro introducing you today, so we'll see. Okay, so um, thermodynamics and order beyond equilibrium was sort of the broadest thing that um, I could think of, which summarized a lot of the talks certainly that were given here last week. And also in particular, I think, um, this is um, a general area which has been very, very active, and um, the last few events I've been on this topic have always been exhilarating, so I'm trying to give you first a little overview in that direction, and I'm going to start in the 19th century um, with equilibrium thermodynamics. Um, so this is, of course, something you all know, but I think it may be worth spelling out. Um, it's just at least on one slide here. So um, when we see a picture like this, completely intuitively and without being physicists or anything, we've got a very concrete expectation of what will happen if we come back sometime later. And that expectation is it's not going to look like this anymore. And this intuition really comprises two ideas which um, are fundamental. One is the idea of equilibration, that a macroscopic system eventually will reach a steady state. But in addition to that, there's the idea of thermalization, which is that I don't have to tell you all that much information for you to guess what this equilibrium state is going to look at, uh, going to look like. So um, in particular here, the idea is if I tell you what the temperature of the room is where this has been taken, then you'll expect if you come back later, you'll either find um, a lot of little ice crystals or you're going to find a puddle of water. Okay. And this is sort of obvious, as I said. Um, our ancestors have known that a long time before they could read and write. And, um, but nonetheless, um, this, doesn't always, this isn't always the case, and much of physics have, has been um, um, concerned with the question, what happens if this isn't the case? And, but then a question that has been asked in much more intensively very recently um, is why and how this actually is the case from a different perspective. And that perspective is one which is, again, relatively new, even though all the questions, of course, could have been and, and to some extent were asked a long time ago. So this is that in the 20th century, which we are now entering, the idea of quantum mechanics came up. Um, and in some sense, a very apparently very simple way of describing a many-body system is as a coherent quantum system. There's always the question, what is the wave function of the universe? But even um, asking things, um, uh, in a more restricted fashion. So imagine you've got an isolated system, that is to say you don't have a bath. Um, what does the system do if I start it off one way or another? Um, and what does it do in long, at long times? So the reason, of course, this question has only been asked relatively recently in a lot of detail is that before that, it simply wasn't particularly relevant for a lot of systems. So for instance, for condensed matter physics, particular magnets, um, experimentally relevant timescales can be picoseconds or nanoseconds on which you completely lose coherence. And so then the question what a coherent quantum system of macroscopic size without a bath, without a bath does is relatively um, um, experimentally irrelevant. But of course, with cold atoms, it's become possible to study coherence on much longer length scales, uh, timescales. And then the issue is, well, what do these systems do? So the expectation is that thermodynamics should emerge at the end of the day, um, because it would be somewhat disappointing if we needed an entirely new theory for coherent quantum systems, which is completely at odds with what we have seen um, um, so far. But of course, it didn't have to be like this. But it turns out thermodynamics more or less does emerge in a very large range of settings. And exactly why and how it does so is somewhat subtle. But perhaps the um, clearest um, idea um, conceptually for formulating this was um, um, provided by what's known as the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which basically says that if you've got an observable, a physical macroscopic observable, then it's going to be a smooth function of the eigenenergy of an eigenstate of your macroscopic quantum system. Okay, so this is a very important um, idea. So you basically say, I've got 
<clears throat> a big quantum system with an unimaginably large Hilbert space and an unimaginably large number of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I take one of them and I evaluate an expectation value of a macroscopic observable, then a priori, I would say, okay, I have no idea what it's going to be, but it turns out if I plot um, expectation values of some observable as a function of eigenstate energy, then what I get is a smooth curve, and the scatter around the smooth curve decreases as the system gets bigger and bigger. Okay, so that's basically the idea here. Then if I do not um, have an eigenstate of a system, but I actually have a state of the system which is composed of a large number of eigenstates around a particular energy, the observable is not going to change in value because all of these um, eigenstates individually have the, same, um, uh, have the same value of the observable. Okay, so this is basically the um, um, very basic idea of how thermodynamics and coherent quantum dynamics can be reconciled. And um, this is somewhat fortunate because a number of concepts actually are rather tricky in quantum mechanics. So for instance, the idea of having a many-body wave function at finite energy density, which is an eigenstate of the system, is physically probably not particularly well defined simply because you lack the experimental apparatus and the time to prepare such a many-body eigenstate. Okay. So with this in hand, so understanding that the foundations of the uh, field and the connections of thermodynamics and quantum mechanics are more or less intact, then the next question is, well, what happens if I go beyond equilibrium? And what happens if I go beyond equilibrium is, of course, an extremely broad question. So here I've got a little picture of a non-equilibrium system. Um, I would love to explain exactly how this came about to you, um, but unfortunately I can't because I'm only a physicist. Um, and, of course, the two messages I want to have here is non-equilibrium system in the everyday world is absolutely the norm, otherwise we'd just be living in a soup which is thermodynamically uniform, but also non-equilibrium systems are too complex in full generality. So in this particular case, you're non-equilibrium in many ways, and one particularly severe case in which you're non-equilibrium is that um, you're strongly history dependent if you ran the same experiment again um, by starting um, with um, the creation of the universe, what you'd find is that probably the Great Barrier Reef would look considerably different the second time round. Okay, so in that sense, um, we would like to take a physicist's perspective and say, okay, we start with thermodynamics and, then, and, um, and equilibrium physics, and then we're going to go slightly away from equilibrium. We're going to see what we can keep and what we have to change um, to go um, beyond. Okay, and there have been very interesting developments, um, and one thing worth rem remembering, even today when uh, there's so much activity in this field, of course, people have been studying non-equilibrium quantum systems for a very, very long time indeed. Arguably, some of the earliest applications of um, quantum mechanics um, have been and, um, have been in non-equilibrium systems, and then there's some very famous non-equilibrium systems which have informed um, our view of um, how these systems behave in general, um, which are rather old. Okay, but nonetheless, I think the perspective has changed quite a lot in the last 10 years or so, and a number of ideas have come up which have a certain degree of generality and which underpin um, quite a few topics which are being studied um, in uh, last week and the next few weeks in, uh, in this workshop here. So one is that you don't just have um, the normal thermodynamic ensembles like you know, microcanonical and grand canonical and whatever ensemble you'd like to work with, but they're actually generalized ensembles as well, so called sometimes generalized Gibbs ensembles, which play an important role in integrable systems where you've got conservation laws above and beyond um, what you have from just <coughs> considering particle number conservation or energy conservation. So this is something where, again, several participants of this workshop have made a lot of contributions. Then, um, uh, another very, very broad set of questions is the questions of um, quantum quenches and equilibration physics. So where you basically ask the question, I set off my system somehow, so it certainly is history dependent because the initial state um, is a state which, I've, which I can carefully choose myself. And then you ask, what does the equilibration physics look like? So first of all, is there equilibration? Do you reach a steady state? And secondly, um, what is the mechanism whereby you reach a steady state? And this is a field which is really incredibly rich, um, and I would um, really love to give you an overview of what's happening there at the moment, but I think it's not quite at, the, at that level yet. I'll just mention a couple of things. So one is, um, well, some of the questions you can ask is if you've got a diffusive system, so with some conservation laws, and you perturb it in a particular location, how does this perturbation spread in space-time under um, 
um, normal evolution. And one of the things that you find, for instance, is that in, even in systems which have diffusive dynamics, if you look at some overlaps as a function of space and time, you can still have light cone transmission of the information that you've made a perturbation. And people have tried to um, quantify these ideas and give them a, some systematic mean, meaning. And this is a very active field, also with considerable input from high energy physics at the moment. And the kind of catchphrases that people use are the butterfly effect. So the idea you change something here, and then things change completely um, within the slide cone. There's a question of, in many body physics, what is the strongest um, um, influence that such a perturbation can possibly have? And then the kind of um, um, objects that people study in this context are out-of-time ordered correlators. And one thing that's really specific to um, quantum systems is the question, how does entanglement grow as, say, as you start with a product state and you um, perturb it locally? OK, another very big set of questions are open systems. So here, basically, reverse engineering what we've been doing in condensed matter physics for a long time. So rather than saying I'm starting with a system which is strongly coupled to the environment, I start with one which is basically coherent, and then I couple it weakly to the environment, and then I ask what happens to the quantum coherence, and can I get interesting physics um, in, in such a setup. OK, um, what I'm going to be discussing for the rest of the talk, however, are slightly different settings. So this is driven systems and um, with a sprinkling of many body localizations, so that will become clear um, as time goes on. But the basic idea is I'm going to look at a system which is quantum coherent, but which doesn't have a time-independent Hamiltonian. Rather, I'm going to look at one where the Hamiltonian is time-dependent, and then I'm going to ask, well, clearly once you've got time dependence in the Hamiltonian, it's no longer possible to have a totally temporally structureless um, state, because if you're system is, uh, if your Hamiltonian is time, independent, time dependent, it would be hard to see how the system itself can be time independent at long times. But the question nonetheless is, in what way is it going to be time dependent? OK, so this is the study of driven systems. And so coming back to the idea that um, even though we'd like to describe this, we actually have to describe something which we're capable of describing. I'm going to look at the simplest way of going away from equilibrium. And that idea is periodic driving. So rather than taking a general time-dependent Hamiltonian, I'm going to take a time Hamiltonian, the time dependence of which is chosen to be relatively simple. That is to say, I take a non-stationary Hamiltonian, but one which um, repeats after a period capital T. So there are many, many systems in nature which are approximately periodically driven. So here the Beach and Blackpool, which many of you will remember from childhood outings, I'm sure. Um, so the um, here, the idea is that the system approximately repeats every 12 or 24 hours. Um, and then you can ask, what is the consequence of this? And in particular, I'm going to be asking two precise questions. So one is, what happens to thermodynamics once you have this periodic driving so that energy is not conserved? Is there some sense in which there are still periodic ensembles? And then I'm going to ask a separate question, which is, in the setting, can you still define the notion of order? That is to say, this idea that you can go from one ordered state to another ordered state with a phase transition in between, or is it rather the case that you get rid of, you know, that you destroy thermodynamics immediately as soon as you um, drive the system and as soon as you leave this paradigm um, of a steady state that you get at long times? OK, so to set up the question in more detail, so. Um, Periodic driving is also known as flow K systems. There's a non-stationary Hamiltonian which repeats after period capital T so that the Fourier transform um, only contains comm periods commensurate with a fundamental frequency omega. The Hamiltonian of a system generates infinitesimal time translations, um, but um, um, since the Hamiltonian is not time independent, one use for quantity to look at for flow K systems is uh, the operator which generates discrete time translations, in particular the time evolution operator over one period. So this unitary operator, it's unitary because it's a, um, um, it's a closed system without any dissipation, takes the wave function at time zero and gives back the wave function at time t after the time-dependent Hamiltonian has acted for one period. Okay, so that's a well-defined quantity, and you can use this and this is essentially notation more than anything else, to define what's called a flow K Hamiltonian, because any unitary transformation, uh, unitary matrix can be written as the exponential of a Hermitian one. And this Hermitian one is called the flow K Hamiltonian, H flow K. And you shouldn't be put off by the fact that this is called a Hamiltonian, um, 
because even though I mean, there are some things which are rather special about it, so even though um, the, um, the driving Hamiltonian may be local at any point in time, the Floca Hamiltonian need not necessarily be local and in fact generally will not be local. However, what's useful about it is that this Floquet Hamiltonian has a standard eigensystem, that is to say, like any Hermitian matrix, it's got eigenvectors and eigenvalues which form a complete set. So a lot of the intuition that you have about um, quantum systems which come from thinking about eigenstates and eigen, uh, eigenvalues carries over to this Floquet Hamiltonian. Okay, and I'm going to introduce one concept without any further proof. Um, in part, in part because they don't have one. Um, so this is that the idea that equilibration gets replaced by a concept of synchronization. So in other words, in equilibration, what you say is that there's a steady state which the system reaches at long times. And this gets replaced by the idea that you've got a quasi-steady state which has periodic properties. That is to say, if um, within the period, at the same point within the period, you measure an observable stroboscopically, so here, time t later, time 2t later, time 3t later, then that this stroboscopic time series is going to become time independent in the long time limit. So this is known as synchronization, which replaces the idea of equilibration. And the idea is that the synchronized state um, um, then replaces the equilibrium state. And what we're going to consider are essentially the properties of the synchronized state. So there's no theorem guaranteeing the existence of synchronization, and in fact, um, towards the end, I'm going to present one state to you which is not synchronized, but rather which where perhaps the most remarkable property is that it fails to be synchronized, even though it's a rather simple system. Okay, so that's the basic setup. Non-stationary Hamiltonian, periodic, and then the time evolution operator, which you can use to define a flow Hamiltonian. Okay, so um, I'm going to present a number of different systems to you. Um, which have different Hamiltonians, the hope is that these Hamiltonians are in some sense generic. That is to say, if I, put, if I perturb the Hamiltonian somewhat, the results wouldn't change very much. We again don't really have a proof of this, even though there are a lot of indications that this is often the case. Um, and I'm not going to specify the Hamiltonians in particularly much detail throughout this talk, but they all have the following properties. So the Hamiltonian, so the systems are closed, that is to say there's no dissipation, there's a simple unitary time evolution. I'm assuming that there's a bounded energy density. That is to say, for instance, I've got a system of fermions, or hardcore bosons, or spins on a chain. And all the systems I'm going to be discussing explicitly are going to be one-dimensional. Then the Hamiltonian has static and time-dependent terms. And the driving, as I said, is always periodic with frequency omega. And I'm fixing the amplitude u, which I'm not changing throughout the talk. And then the hope, as I said, is that the details are unimportant, and whereas we certainly don't have a concept of universality for flow K systems yet, the word I like to use is that the behavior is generic. Okay, and if you want to have a picture of the system that we are studying, you can, depending on which community you come from, either think of, say, fermions or hardcore bosons, where um, there's a disorder potential shown in black, which has different heights, um, then the fermions can either be occupied or unoccupied on each side. This is the variable ni. They can hop and they can interact with each other. If you prefer spin systems, then um, an occupied side is a spin up, an unoccupied side is a spin down. The potential becomes a magnetic field. The hopping is an xy exchange and the interaction is an easing exchange. And I'm going to be using these languages um, interchangeably in the rest of this talk. OK. Um, the first result I'd like and the most general result I'd like to present to you with is what happens um, to eigenstate thermalization in a flow K system. So um, again, the number of rigorous results we have on this is limited, but there have been some contributions, for instance, by Dima Banen, who's here, um, on analyzing this with some degree um, of mathematical rigor, but I'm going to present to you a very simple picture, which certainly was very useful in guiding us when we did this work. So, the fundamental difference between a flow K system and a time independent system is that you no longer have time translation invariance. Losing time translation invariance is a big deal because, as you know, conservation laws are implied by symmetries. So energy conservation follows from time translation invariance. So if you remove time translation invariance, you lose energy conservation. So since you're driving periodically, you don't fully lose energy conservation, but rather you lose energy conservation modulo 
what you might call a photon energy omega, so modulo um, the time period t, in the same way that if you have a periodic lattice potential, you lose momentum conservation modulo reciprocal lattice vectors. So the photon energy of your drive, omega is basically a reciprocal lattice vector in that sense. Okay, so now your system can absorb photons, <coughs> and the actual question how your system absorbs photons is, I think, not worked out and is not particularly simple either. If I give you a general system and you shine a laser on it, you will have to analyze in a lot of detail what actually happens to decide what the long time state is. But there's a very simple picture that you can make, which is imagine you just plot the many body density of states, log rho, um, as a function of energy density. Then you know that there's a very big maximum um, somewhere at finite energy density, and if you start the system somewhere else, if you just think that it randomly connects states um, differing by a photon energy omega and either absorbs a photon or emits a photon under the action um, of the driving, then just statistically you'll inevitably be driven to the, system, uh, to the location where the density of states is maximal. And since this is exponentially dominated um, at the maximum of the density of states, your system will invariably be driven to the, uh, to the uh, location where the density of states is maximal. Okay, so the basic idea is you drive your system, it keeps absorbing and emitting photons, and at the end of the day, statistically speaking, it will end up somewhere in the middle of the band where your many body state of state, density of states is maximal. So you can then ask, what does this look like in the eigen, um, eigenstate thermalization picture, which I presented at the very beginning of this talk? So the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis said that the observable is a smooth function of energy. But I also said that energy is no longer there. Now you have quasi-energy, which is also periodic, just like, the, uh, just, like, um, um, just like the crystal momentum. So you no longer have a notion of high and low quasi-energy. It's much more that you live on a circle, which you keep going round and round. And so if you want to define a smooth function on the circle, and you don't have an idea of what's big or what's small um, for the angle around the circle, the simplest smooth function that you can think of is a constant. Okay, And so here we've actually plotted um, many body systems, some observable, um, as a function of quasi-energy. And what you find, so we've, this is a density, and the system is initialized uh, as um, uh, the sector we're looking at is half, um, half filling. And what you basically find is that the many body, density, uh, the many body states have independently of quasi-energy, the many-body eigenstates um, of the Floquet Hamiltonian have a constant um, 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 expectation value of the density at one particular site. Okay, so this is worth emphasizing, is really as boring as it gets. So you take any eigenstate at any time during the drive, and you find the density of um, particles on a particular site is constant. Okay. So this is sometimes called an infinite temperature average, and the way you can motivate this is that you say, well, in thermodynamics, I've got temperature, which is related to the energy conservation, um, and this is the structure which gives me a difference in occupancy of different sites at high and at low energies. If I now get rid of energy conservation, then, my, then basically this structure is gone, and I no longer have anything that restricts the states I'm averaging over, so morally I'm averaging over all the states, and this is where the infinite temperature average comes from. So the generic statement, therefore, is if I periodically drive a many-body system, it will heat up to infinite temperature. Okay, well, this is great. This is an extremely general statement. Um, so this is what happens to thermodynamics, to equilibrium thermodynamics. And um, you know, half the talk's over by now, so you have some right to expect that there will be something more coming afterwards. But I think it's really worth emphasizing this is the story as far as equilibrium thermodynamics as a periodic system is concerned. So you maximize the entropy subject to no constraints, and you end up with the infinite temperature ensemble. So then the natural question is, is there anything else? So the reason we were very confident that there's something else, because we happen to have found something else before already, that was a generalization of the, um, that was a periodic version of the generalized Gibbs ensemble, and that made it very clear what you need to do, is you need to reintroduce constraints one way or another. So in the periodic Gibbs ensemble, the fact that you've lost energy conservation is unimportant because an integrable system has got enough different conservation laws. But integrable systems, even though, of course, many people have studied them for good reasons for a lot of time, are special in the sense that the integrability tends to be non-robust. That is to say, under generic perturbation of the Hamiltonian, the integrability is lost, and you'd go back to this infinite um, temperature ensemble. Are there any other constraints 
um, like in the static case, other than integrability. And the constraints I'm going to be using are those provided by many body localization, which is believed to be um, another way of having generically stable um, um, systems with conservation laws. I'm going to generalize that to flow case systems. OK, so that's basically the um, fundamental input which I'm going to be using. But so the first half of the talk um, is if you have a generic many body system, it's going to heat up to infinite temperature in a flow K setting. So one way to stop this, other than going to an integrable system, is a many body localized one. So um, to go back to these pictures where you have eigenstates as a function of um, um, eigenstate energy, eigenstate of, um, expectation values as a function of energy, so this is this MBL setting where you get a smooth function. But in this other paradigmatic setting of many body localization, things don't look like that at all. So if you go between two adjacent eigenstates, the expectation value of the density may change really a lot, okay? So um, states adjacent energy in the MBL setting can look very different. And um, I'd love to give you an introduction to many body localization, um, which is a pretty young subject and still very much in flux. Um, there are a lot of open questions, such as does many body localization exist in two dimensions or does it even exist in one dimension? But um, I think there's a general agreement nowadays that at least in one dimension, many body localization is a generic phenomenon, and this is the setting in which I'm going to talk about things. So many body localization is a rather simple, uh, rather, uh, rather um, 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 subtle concept, but the nice thing about it is that it's got a very simple limit, um, which is really extremely easy to understand because it's a basically completely simple classical problem. So imagine an easing magnet in a strong random field or alternatively um, some lattice fermions in a very strong random potential. So the Hamiltonian is just H Z sigma Z or mu i n i. And you can easily diagonalize this because it already is diagonalized. You simply give the uh, locations of the um, fermions and then you can add up their potential and that gives you the eigenstate energy. So in this setting, you immediately see why two adjacent states can look so very different. As imagine you change a state only a little bit by having a fermion hop to a neighboring site. Since the disorder is very strong, that means the energy is going to change a great deal as you hop, from, as you hop only a single fermion. So in order to um, make um, up for this very small, uh, for this very big energy change, you have, to, you have to move another fermion somewhere else and another fermion somewhere else. So basically what you do is you do a random, or you, you add numbers which are very large, namely these um, energy differences um, between neighboring sites. And if you add numbers which are very, very large in the hope of having a result which then turns out to be very small, you basically need to have a lot of luck that this random walk of um, large numbers just by chance ends up really close to the origin once you've added up the different numbers. So in order to have this luck, you need a lot of entropy. So many attempts give you um, the right to end up near the um, origin, but that then of course means that you've changed your configuration a lot. So that is to say, if you want a state here which, has, which is really extremely close in energy, you may have to go a very long way until you find that state. Whereas if you only take a few steps, then chances are you'll, start, you'll end up a long way away in energy. So that's basically the idea here. Now, the miraculous thing about MBL, which is totally non-trivial, that's again work here, is that um, this is actually stable to perturbations of the Hamiltonian. So even though I've motivated everything with a purely classical Hamiltonian, the idea is you can put, do anything to the Hamiltonian as long as it's local and as long as it's weak, and this picture is going to remain. So what we had here is the local site occupancy or the local spin orientations becomes L bits or local bits, which are then conserved. Okay, so that's basically the story here. But for the purposes of what follows, you can keep this little picture in mind. Okay, and now the question here is, um, what happens to MBL systems when you drive them? And again, here's a very simple picture, which is um, there are two different regimes. One is the regime of fast driving, and the other one is the regime of slow driving. And again, I'm, I'm sweeping all sorts of subtleties under the rug, but the basic idea is this. Imagine you've got a long system, which has got some appropriately defined correlation, uh, localization length xi. And the statement that something is localized basically means that 
if you cut it, or that there's no communication between points in this uh, system which are separated by more, much more than a localization length. So imagine cutting your system at such distances, then the idea is you don't change things very much anymore, but then you can ask, well, now I've got a finite size system, what happens to this finite size system when I drive it? And so a finite size system has, an uh, has a density of states which has got the nice property that it's bounded, um, so the total um, energy difference between the highest energy state and the lowest energy state of a finite size system is of order one. And so now you can distinguish a fast driving regime where the photon energy with which you're driving is much bigger than this bandwidth. And if that's the case, then basically your system can't absorb any photons because there's no allowed transition from an initial state to a final state which has got this energy difference. And so the system just sits there and ignores the fact that you're throwing photons at it. By contrast, if you make the driving frequency smaller and smaller, then at some stage the system notices, great, I can connect my low energy to my high energy states, I can absorb lots of photons, and then that's what the system does. And so then the many body localization is melted as the system heats up again. So in other words, at high frequencies, you're more or less in a static case, where at low disorder you're eigenstate thermalized, at high disorder you're in an MBL phase. But then as you de decrease the frequency, the um, MBL phase um, um, retracts um, at the, uh, to the benefit of the um, eigenstate thermalized phase, and um, therefore you basically go to this infinite temperature ensemble. But the important thing is for sufficiently high frequencies of the drive, flow K MBL exists, and this picture um, of the um, eigenstate chaos um, is present rather than this um, infinite temperature flow K um, 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 MB, um, ETH picture. Okay, so that's basically the second statement. So there is flow K ETH, but there's also flow K MBL. Okay, and that um, finishes my first question, what happens to thermodynamics? So zeroth order answer is it gets completely boring. And first order answer, if you go away from equilibrium, actually some rather interesting structures in many body physics which have been discovered in static systems also persist to periodic, periodically driven system. Okay, now I'd like to move on to the issue of order and flow K systems. So this comes back to the question, if I've got states which are separated by a phase transition, is that kind of structure does that kind of structure persist to um, flow K systems? So for the generic case, no, at least um, not in any obvious way because all states are at infinite temperature and don't have any non-trivial correlations, so um, there's also no phase transitions. Um, however, in MBL systems where you no longer have the notion of equilibrium, you can nonetheless define a certain notion of order, and that notion of order is known as eigenstate order, and that's a relatively simple um, picture which you can um, um, extract, say, or which people in practice use quite a lot for even um, determining whether exact diagonalizations on particular lattice model display order or not. And that's basically the following. If you plot the energies, uh, the level, the, if you plot the energy axis and you make a little line wherever you've got a, uh, an eigenstate of your Hamiltonian, then um, if the eigenstate is uh, non-degenerate, then people, then this tends to correspond to a disordered state. So imagine um, a transverse field easing model. So a transverse field easing model, when the transverse field dominates, has a unique ground state, namely all spins point along the, um, um, the external field. And then if you flip the first spin, there's a finite energy gap to that. And so there's a big gap here. By contrast, if you are uh, dominated by the exchange, then you've got the ferromagnetic state and the second ferromagnetic state with all spins flipped. And the splitting between these two happens to be exponentially small, basically because you need to generate a domain wall, sweep it across the system, and sweeping it across the system gives you a, an action which um, grows linearly with the system size, and therefore the splitting between the two states is just the exponential of this action, so exponentially small. So this is, as I said, how in practice you tend to um, look at discrete symmetry breakings and exact diagonalizations, and the nice insight in MBL systems was that you can actually define this not just at the ground state, but also for excited states. So the statement for MBL systems is you can have this kind of eigenstate order where all the states are paired. The way you roughly see how this can happen is imagine the transverse field easing model I just gave you is not periodic, but it's actually strongly disordered. So then, 
If you, you can take, and again, go to the case where the exchange dominates, but the exchange is strongly disordered. That is to say, if you put a domain wall at site i, it's got a completely different energy than if you put the domain wall at site i plus one. So therefore, if you then want to connect one glassy state with more or less randomly um, oriented um, spins with its easing reverse counterpart, you again have to generate a domain wall and you have to gen um, sweep this domain wall across the system. And since the energy of the domain wall as a function of site is not constant, you're going to get exactly the same degenerate perturbation theory as you got for the ground state. In particular, you're going to get an exponentially small splitting between any states, um, even the excited ones higher up in the spectrum. So in that sense, you can have eigenstate order in MBL systems, which is even more robust than order in conventional systems. But you do need disorder in many body localization for this eigenstate order to be present. But basically, the kind of question you can ask, do my um, many body states come in pairs or do they come singly? So the flow K version is more or less the same, except for the energy is now periodic. But what you're still asking is, do the causal energies become, become isolated singlets or in paired doublets? This is for easing systems. The generalization to other cases is more or less straightforward. OK. So I just mentioned to you that there should be a, a spin glass of the type which has got eigenstate order. And in fact, you can find one of this relatively easily. So you write down a Hamiltonian, which has an integrability breaking term, but basically is this transverse field easing model I just told you about. And then what you do is you basically measure an Edwards-Anderson order parameter, which more or less is a long distance spin correlator. You need to square that because even, this, even though the state may be rigid, um, you can't predict as a matter of principle um, if the state here points up, does the state over there point up as well? In a ferromagnet, this is obvious. If the spin here points up, it has to point up um, as well a long distance away. But in a spin glass, it may point up or down. The important thing is that it's frozen to point either the same way or the opposite way. So to get rid of this, uh, this uh, uncertainty in sign, you square something, but basically you're asking, is the correlation big? plus one or minus one, in which case this is a big number, or is it small and goes to zero. And so what you find, if you have um, a system where the exchange dominates, then this Edwards-Anderson order parameter is large, and it goes to a finite value as the system gets big. By contrast, if you um, have a very strong disordering field, the Edwards-Anderson order parameter scales to zero, so that here you've got a flow K MBL paramagnet, and here you've got a flow K MBL um, ferromagnet. Uh, uh, spin glass. Okay, so this is just an illustration of what I said a second ago. You can have this kind of eigenstate order even in the flow K setting. So to look for the eigenstate order directly, what you basically do is you um, um, look at some spectral function where you sum over all possible pairs of states. You take some operator which doesn't commute with the um, Hamiltonian, and then you basically ask if I've got an eigenstate at quasi energy. Um, um, at one quasi energy, what's the likelihood of having a second state as a quasi energy which differs by omega? And what you find in the regime where you've got um, a flow K paramagnet, um, there's no particular structure to this curve. By contrast, if you then drive the system towards the um, flow K spin glass, you find this big, big peak um, at quasi energy difference zero, which is exactly this picture here of eigenstate order, that they always come in pairs. OK, and now, again, so this is completely standard. It basically says you start driving, many body localization survives, and you start driving, and spin glassiness survives. So the surprising bit is the next slide. So we've changed the Hamiltonian in a way which um, uh, we guessed based on some work by Diptyman Sense group. And um, what you then find is that you can have the same spectral function, but the peak, which used to be at 0, is now not suddenly at pi over t or at pi. So this is why we called it the pi spin glass. So in other words, you can have eigenstate order, and the st um, eigenstates still appear in pairs, but they appear in pairs no longer next to each other, but diametrically opposed to each other. That's just the statement of saying that there's an eigenstate uh, quasi-energy difference of pi between the two. And you immediately see that this kind of setting does not have a correspondence in the static case, because the limit of taking um, the static Hamiltonian makes this um, a circle bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's clearly a singular limit. And so um, this kind of um, um, flow K pi spin glass really is new and does not have a corresponding um, uh, does not have a corresponding 
um, type of order in the static case. So let's think about this pi spin glass a little bit more, but this is basically the sort of first truly surprising um, result that I've got here. So whereas flow K driving tends to destroy most of thermodynamics, and if you try hard enough, it keeps some of the structures that you have out of equilibrium, it actually generates a genuinely new structure which is manifested in this pi um, eigenstate order. Okay, so there's actually a very simple semi-classical picture for what's going on. And this is, so we're looking always at easing systems here, so if you've got an easing order parameter, you can basically um, distinguish between um, a direction and the direction uh, inverted overall. And as you, um, and as is the case in finite size systems, um, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, in fact, are not the simple spin up or spin down eigenstates, but actually the linear combinations of the up plus minus the down eigenstates. So these are <coughs> the cat states, um, um, which are very popular in, um, well, I guess, at the ESI among other places. So now there are two different settings. If you imagine you look at this little compass needle which tells you what your easing parameter is doing and you just follow it over one period. So over one period there's a possibility that there's a net integer number of rotations. Zero is one option but two or four is another one. Um, and then you get back to where you started from and so the plus minus states become the plus minus states. However, the other option is that you have a net half integer number of rotations. So in other words, the up state becomes the down state, the down state becomes the up state. And what that means is that the plus state, which is a symmetric combination, remains the plus state, but the minus state um, becomes minus the minus state because these two things are exchanged. <clears throat> so you see that under exactly the same time evolution, the plus cat state is um, basically unchanged, but the minus cat state picks up a factor of minus one. The factor of minus one is, of course, a phase of pi, and this is the pi energy difference of the pi spin glass. So what this basically tells you is that you've got a non-trivial trajectory um, in order parameter space, which takes you from one period to the next um, in a non-trivial way. Okay, so the diagnostic is the time, in, time dependence of um, the order parameter over a full period. Okay, so, and this really is the central result of the slide. So, the system returns to itself not after a period capital T, but after a period of capital 2T. So this is known as period doubling. And this is a new kind of symmetry breaking because you don't just break the spatial symmetry of the spin glass, but you also break um, the time translational symmetry because it takes you twice the driving period to come back to where you started from. And this is the reason this has been called a time crystal because, um, well, because it breaks a symmetry which the Hamiltonian has, and then discrete time translations by period t and replaces it just by a time translational symmetry with period 2t. Okay, of course it doesn't, of course you've helped it along by breaking the continuous time translational symmetry in the first place, but um, what you're left with is what's known now as a discrete time crystal, a flow k time crystal. Okay, one special feature about this pi spin glass is that it's extremely robust so perhaps the biggest surprise is even against easing symmetry breaking terms, you can actually get this period doubling. Um, but it's not robust against fluctuations in the driving periodicity. If you do that, then the, um, this type of order melts. So in that sense, it's a symmetry protected, um, double, uh, symmetry protected phase. Okay, so that's basically um, the central outcome here. So we've got this new kind of um, spatial temporal order um, which combines the breaking of the spatial translation symmetry with the breaking of the time translational symmetry. And um, so this is something we did, um, I think, 2015 or 16, and one of the very uh, nice surprises in this field was that experiments followed not long after. There have been, like, I think, three or four experiments by now, one on NMR, one on um, nitrogen vacancies in diamond, and this one here on ion traps, uh, which I'm going to be discussing. Um, and I'd be happy to take some more questions on this. But basically what they're doing is they're looking at an easing model with what we call a ternary drive. So there are three parts of the Hamiltonian. And rather than having a sinusoidal um, change of the Hamiltonian, what they do is for part of the period, they have one part of the Hamiltonian, the second part, and the, the second one, and the third part, the third one. Let me describe those in turn. So you have got your easing spins. Um, this is actually a rather small system of about eight or 10 sites. <clears throat> 
and you rotate it. So the first part of the Hamiltonian rotates the spins by almost, but not exactly, an angle pi. So if you look at the magnetization, um, you see that from each period to the next, so this is the stroboscopic picture, the magnetization inverts almost completely, but since the phase has been detuned, the rotation has been tuned from angle pi, there's this beats here, which um, the frequency of which is given by the amount of the detuning. If you take the magnetization and your Fourier transform it, then what you find is this peak not at period doubling, but just a little bit away from period doubling, just reflecting those, um, uh, this, these beats here. So the second thing that you need, second ingredient, is um, disorder. So this is the second part of the Hamiltonian. So when this is switched on, the magnetization initially behaves pretty similarly, but since each of the sites now behaves slightly differently, this coherence at long times is lost, and you get a decaying envelope, and then this rather messy picture here. But basically, if you take a Fourier transform, you still see that you've detuned your system away from period dump, uh, from, um, from uh, a full rotation into, um, uh, into periods, and there's still this double peak structure. And then what they can do is they can switch on interactions um, so that each of the spins talks to each of the other spins um, in a way which is essentially algebraically decaying with distance. And if you do this, what you see is a picture which is yet again changed. So again, you've got this almost pi, you've got this change of the sign um, um, of the magnetization after each period. But rather than having this disordered mess here and rather than having the beats, actually there's an overall decaying envelope and underneath the envelope you've got this exact period doubling. So even though you're still trying to imprint a frequency which is different from a half, the system spontaneously locks in at the frequency which is just a half of the driving frequency. And so this is what you would have expected for the pi spin glass because the pi spin glass essentially prefers spontaneously to break the symmetry at a half and it's stable towards perturbations. So in other words, the perturbation that your driving angle is not pi, but pi minus epsilon, it simply gets um, washed out and the, this eigenstate order is actually stable against that. Okay, so this is basically the experimental verification. There's a lot of small print. So one thing, these are pretty long range interacting systems. So whether you'd like to call this a one, uh, a one dimensional system is I think pretty open to discussion. Whether you'd like to call a system with 10 sites, a one dimensional system is also open to discussion. And whether um, as a matter of um, principle, you'd um, call something which is small enough that you can simulate it on a computer, um, a uh, confirmation of a theory which you simulated on your computer is also an open question. But I think as a matter of principle, um, anyone who's tried to make predictions for experiment is of course extremely happy if something like this happens on such a time scale. And this is certainly a very um, active p um, piece of work now. Okay, so central thing is response locks stably at period doubling. So this was then a big deal. Um, so apparently a time crystal looks a lot like a quartz watch. Right. Okay, but um, I'd like to finish now. I'd like to acknowledge the main collaborators so for the um, bits of work that I've presented here. All the Floquet work was done, um, uh, actually I got, in, got interested by um, two postdocs at my, um, at my institute, Achilles Lazaridis and Anab Das, who's since moved on to Calcutta, and then the um, Floquet time crystal business that we did um, when Shivaji Sondi was spending his um, sabbatical with his um, graduate student, Vedika Kimani, with us. Vedika is now in Harvard, sorry. Okay, so I motivated all of this with what happens to thermodynamics um, and ordering in, um, um, if you go out of equilibrium. And the most gentle way of going out of equilibrium was periodically driven systems. Um, there are a number of ensembles. I briefly mentioned the periodic Gibbs ensembles, but the two generic ones would be Floquet ETH and Floquet MBL. Then in a Floquet setting, ordering needs disorder. But if you've got MBL, then eigenstate order generalizes, and the eigenstate order which generalizes is in fact richer than the original eigenstate order, and the example I gave of that was the pi spin glass, where you get a new type of spatial temporal order with a new type of diagnostic, and this has since been verified in the experiment. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.